You might have heard of big O notation, maybe in the context of sorting algorithms or P versus MP. Often, explanations of big O notation use fancy words like polynomial or exponential without explaining what they mean. So I want to take a stab at explaining big O notation using only basic arithmetic. So check out this sequence of numbers where we assume that off screen the numbers just kind of keep going. You'll notice that at each step the value increases by 2. In this video we're only gonna deal with sequences that increase at each step, never ones that decrease. So compare the first sequence to this sequence, where the value increases by 3 at each step. Now let me ask you this, which one of these sequences is bigger? Or rather, at a certain step, which sequence has a higher value? Let's compare, for instance, the fourth element of each sequence. Clearly, the second sequence has a higher value than the first one. But what about, like, the 50th element? Which sequence is going to have a largest 50th element? Well, the second sequence is larger already at the fourth element, and it is also increasing faster than the first one. Certainly then, the first sequence will never catch up to the second one, so the second sequence will have a largest 50th element. In fact, one can say with confidence that the second sequence will be bigger at the thousandth element and at the millionth element and so on. Alright, so let me hit you with a harder one. Compare this sequence, where the numbers are again increasing by 2, to this sequence where the numbers are again increasing by 3. This time, if I asked which sequence has a bigger fourth element, the answer is obviously the first sequence. However, if I ask about the 50th element, the answer is much less obvious, because while the second sequence starts much lower, it is also increasing faster. It turns out that at the 50th element, the first sequence is still larger. But the more interesting part is if I ask about the millionth element. We know that the second sequence increases faster than the first sequence. So we can be certain that the second sequence is going to eventually pass the first one to become the bigger sequence. So even if we don't, for whatever reason, have the capability to calculate the sequences past what we can see here on screen, we can still be confident that at the millionth element, the second sequence will be bigger than the first one. It is the concept of eventuality that I want to talk about in this video. See, for more complicated sequences, it is very possible that the two sequences pass each other back and forth with regards to which one is bigger, just, just over and over again. However, if they reach a point where they stop passing each other, then one can say that one of the sequences is eventually bigger than the other. In other words, we say that a sequence is eventually bigger than another if there is some element after which all elements of the first sequence is bigger than the corresponding element in the second sequence. In a way, one can think of this as the first sequence being bigger than the second sequence is the final state of the system. So with that, check out this sequence that we're going to give a name, T. You'll notice that unlike the other sequences, this one is not increasing at a constant rate. If we write down how much t increases at each step, we find the following. These increases can be considered a sequence in its own right. So we're going to give it a name of its own that will be delta t. In general, given a sequence, if you form a new sequence by looking at how much the sequence increases at each step, then we call that the delta of the original sequence. Now you might notice, delta t, much like the first sequences we dealt with, increases by a constant amount each step. We can make this more concrete by saying that the delta of delta t is a sequence where every element is 1. Such a sequence, where every element is the same, is called a constant sequence. Looking back at the original sequence t, we see that applying delta to t two times results in a constant sequence. 
Any sequence that reaches a constant sequence after applying enough deltas is called a sequence of polynomial growth. T, then, is a polynomial of order 2, where the order tells you how many deltas you need to take to get a constant sequence. So if a sequence is, for example, an order 4 polynomial sequence, then the delta of the delta of the delta of the delta of that sequence is a constant sequence. Now, saying polynomial of order 4 is quite a mouthful, and it's even more annoying to write, which is a reason to use big O notation. In big O notation, sequences of polynomial growth are written as O of n to some power, where the power is the order of the polynomial. As a special case, a constant sequence is written as O of 1, and this is regardless of what the value of the constant sequence is. Because big O notation doesn't care about particular values, but only how the sequence grows as a whole. So say we want to compare the sequence T from before to this other sequence V. At the start of these sequences, clearly V is bigger than T. Is either of them going to be eventually bigger than the other? To figure this out, consider delta T and delta V you might be able to intuit that delta t will become bigger than delta v at somewhere around the hundredth element. This means a couple of things. Firstly, delta t is eventually bigger than delta v. Secondly, bringing t and v back into the mix, since delta t is bigger than delta v after some element, another way of phrasing that is to say that t is increasing by a greater amount than v is after that element. Since t is increasing faster than v, T will eventually catch up to V and pass it. And T will continue to increase faster than V, so V will never be able to catch up and pass T. So the sequence T is eventually bigger than the sequence V. What is important here is that T is a polynomial of order 2, while B is a polynomial of order 1. We can generalize this argument to make a very powerful statement of when one sequence is eventually bigger than another. For any increasing sequences a and b, if delta a is eventually bigger than delta b, then a is eventually bigger than b. Take some time to ponder why this is true. To show this, one would use the exact same argument as we did for the example, with t and v, but more abstract. This is an application of an important mathematical theorem called the Stoltz-Cesaro theorem. What does this mean for polynomial sequences? Well, as an example, suppose that we have a polynomial sequence of order 4 and a polynomial sequence of order 2. When we take the delta of these, we get polynomials of order 3 and 1, respectively. If we take another delta of each, we get a polynomial of order 2 and a constant sequence. Since we're only dealing with increasing sequences, we can be certain that the polynomial of order 2 is going to eventually be bigger than the constant sequence. From the Stoltz-Cesaro theorem, this means that an order 3 polynomial is eventually bigger than an order 1 polynomial, which in turn means that an order 4 polynomial is eventually bigger than an order 2 polynomial. This method can be used to show that in general, for two polynomial sequences of different order, the polynomial with the bigger order will grow faster than the other one. So that's fun, but check this sequence out, where we get from one element to the next by multiplying by 2. Now let me ask you, how fast does this grow compared to the polynomial sequences? To figure this out, let's take the delta, shall we? That's pretty neat, delta e is just equal to e. So what does this mean for its growth rate? Well, first of all, we can clearly see that it's eventually bigger than a constant sequence. Since e equals delta e, we also get that delta e is eventually bigger than a constant sequence. By the Stoltz-Cesaro theorem, this means that e is eventually bigger than an order 1 polynomial. But this means that delta e is eventually bigger than an order 1 polynomial, so e is eventually bigger than an order 2 polynomial. And we can keep going like this. 
E grows faster than an order 3 polynomial, it grows faster than an order 4 polynomial, an order 5 polynomial, etc, etc. In short, E is eventually bigger than any polynomial sequence. Let's take a step back to appreciate this. We could have like a thousand order polynomial that grows absurdly fast, whilst E is just merely doubling itself each step. But eventually, E is going to catch up and even surpass this giant polynomial. E is an example of a sequence of exponential growth. Another such example would be this one, where the elements of its delta are twice the original sequence. In general, exponential growth is written in big O notation as some number to the nth power. Now, let me ask you this. Say we have this sequence E from before, and also an order one polynomial sequence. Now, let's create a new sequence by adding each element of E to the corresponding element of S. What is the big O of this new sequence E plus S? You might say it's O of 2 to the n plus n to the first. And yeah, you, you'd be right. But it's also far from the full story. Because, think about this. For these early elements, this new sequence E plus S differs quite a bit from both of the sequences E and S. But E grows much faster than S, so later down in the sequence, say at the thousands element, or the millionth element, S is not going to contribute much to E plus S. So sequence E is gonna be quite similar to E plus S. The thing with big O notation is that it only really concerns itself with how sequences eventually behave. So when using big O notation, we only really care about the fastest growing part, or the eventually biggest part. In this case, eventually, the contribution of S is going to be insignificant to the growth of E plus S. Therefore, E plus S has the same big O as just E, 2 to the n. There are of course many more types of growth rates that a sequence can have. Two other common examples are the factorial, which grows even faster than exponentials, and logarithmic sequences, which grows faster than constants, but slower than any polynomial of order greater than zero. It should also be noted that while this video has used whole numbers exclusively, everything still applies when the sequences are made up of fractions. In fact, the order of the polynomials and the base of the exponentials don't need to be whole numbers either. So how does all of this apply to algorithms and p versus np? As an example, take a sorting algorithm. A sorting algorithm is an algorithm that sorts some number of objects. It stands to reason that the more objects we have to sort, the longer the sorting will take. One can create a sequence out of this, where the first element of the sequence is the time it takes to sort just one object, and the second element is the time it takes to sort two objects, and the third element is the time it takes to sort three objects, and so on. One can then figure out the big O of these sequences to determine which algorithm is the least time-consuming for larger collections of objects. With that, you should now be ready to watch any video on P versus NP. And uh, thank you for watching. As a final note, if you're familiar with calculus, you might recognize the stoltz cesaro theorem as a discrete version of L'Hopital's rule. Fun fact! If you liked this video, I've made some videos on quantum physics that you might also enjoy, to so be sure to check those out.